Sebastian is uh, currently a postdoc at the Perimeter Institute, uh, and he uh, is, is his general background is in, in theoretical physics and, and applied maths, and uh, he works in quantum matter, but also in machine learning and statistical physics. Uh, and uh, uh, Sebastian did his PhD in, at the University of Heidelberg in 2018, in, I think in theoretical physics. But now he's going to talk about interpreting artificial neural networks in the context of theoretical physics. Much looking forward and the word is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, thank you very much. I feel, I feel truly honored and uh, humbled and um, thankful for the opportunity and the invitation to speak at this conference. Uh, so let me just say from my perspective, when I, when I started this a little more than four years ago, uh, uh, in the middle of, of studying for my PhD, I've had, I, I didn't know anyone who was, who was doing that. And like people around me didn't, didn't recognize me as this, as this would be a as real research field. And uh, so I'm truly impressed and amazed by how this, young field has evolved to such a big field so fast and uh, like when you when you look in the the eyes of, of different people you you know see how how excited they get about all these new opportunities that can be uh, can be achieved and tackled and uh, with with these new techniques and especially this conference has something that is that is truly special because the focus is not just applying all these tools that the computer scientists gave us, but it's like changing them to some non-traditional machine learning, making them our own and finding uh, things that are uh, far beyond what uh, the computer scientists uh, imagined when, we, when they came up with all these tools, which we are now on, which we are building on. So uh, let, me, let me get to my talk. So my talk is about interpreting artificial neural networks in the context of theoretical physics which uh, is basically a, a title chosen to connect uh, three of my, my papers, which I, I hope I, I successfully found a, found a red path through, through my works. So let me just start with uh, a general slide about artificial neural networks. So uh, let us remember, I'm sure we, we all know of uh, the uh, recent successes of all these cool artificial neural network architectures, which became really famous in 2012 when Hinton with his group and the AlexNet beat uh, all the other traditional uh, existing uh, machine learning algorithms in an image classification competition using a convolutional neural network called AlexNet, uh, which is also the first network that I'm going to mention and interpret in the context of theoretical physics. And uh, another well-known network that was already discussed uh, in some of the previous talks, like yesterday from, uh, by, by Nathan Kutz and uh, today by uh, Renato Renner, uh, which is the autoencoder, which uh, can be used non-traditionally like dated or traditionally for generative modeling or anomaly detection or dimensionality reduction and uh, another network that to my surprise is is little known are Siamese networks for similarity detections. So uh, this is probably one of the networks that uh, most of us have seen in use or used even though we didn't know it uh, when we when we signed up for Facebook a few few years ago. I'm, I'm sure some people remember that at one point, uh, Facebook suggested that you could uh, suggested labels and names for people in your in your pictures, and uh, the one of the iterations of this algorithm included a similarity detection network uh, based off of the si Siamese neural network. So uh, in this case, uh, instead of uh, just giving a label to each person, uh, it checks for are two images the same person or the same class. So, which means you can, you can train on some people's image and then apply it to another person's image that was not in the training data set before 
and still be able to classify this person as this uh, on another image, even though you never had these person's images in the training data set. So let us set the stage. Uh, let's start. Let's start slow. Okay. So if we look at uh, Wikipedia, machine learning is the subfield of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So in our case, we imagine we have an artificial neural network and we have a binary uh, classification problem where we have labeled training data with cats and uh, another class uh, of labeled training data labeled with dogs. And we have this black box artificial neural network uh, algorithm that gets trained to make accurate predictions of uh, the labels on these pictures. So when these algorithms, uh, when this neural network gets a new unknown data point, in this case, a dog picture, if it is successfully trained, it will then be able to tell this is a dog. So the questions that uh, I'm going to address in this talk is, what do these neural networks actually learn? So you could, you could view this from, from different perspectives. It's like you could learn the, uh, you could answer these questions from the type of, of learning dynamics and uh, you could uh, look at it that, uh, from, from the weights, how do they, uh, what do they store? But uh, I wanna get to the point where after they are successfully trained, what are the objects, what are the features that are finally used by these neural networks to make a certain decision? Or it's like, what is the, the, the nature of the encoding in several, several, several different instances? And, uh, uh, the second point was already uh, addressed in in the autoencoder talks that I that I that I mentioned. So it's like, can this knowledge help in scientific discovery? So yes, of course. And uh, in my talk, I will also give some examples how this knowledge can be used in scientific discovery. So this gives me uh, this brings me to an overview of my talk. So first, we we're going to look again, what are artificial neural networks just to come up to speed. And uh, after that, we're uh, discussing several different instances uh, where we applied, uh, where we apply convolutional neural networks, autoencoders, and Siamese neural networks to pr perform a, a certain task on some physical systems. And we see what they have learned. And if we can build upon that, to use uh, these networks in some certain sense, which we will see soon. Okay, so the artificial neural networks, let us just uh, remember what, what these things are built of. And there might be some people who, who, are, who are new to this field. So for them, this slide might also be helpful. So it's like uh, in the simplest case, we consider an artificial feed for a neural network which is a directed, directed uh, graph where we have input data, which gets fed through these hidden layers. And uh, then we obtain some kind of output. All these uh, neurons uh, are so-called perceptrons. Perceptrons are the minimal neural networks, which is one neuron, where we have an input vector, x, weight vector, w, and uh, that gets fed through a nonlinear activation function uh, to give you an output y. Um, the neural network is trained on some da training data uh, that is labeled with y. And the neural network denoted by big F is a function of this training data. There are weights, uh, the weights in all the layers, the biases in all the layers. And uh, uh, the goal is now using a suitable optimization algorithm, uh, which is gradient descent and backpropagation normally to uh, find such weights and biases that uh, neural network prediction is close to the labels and not just on a training data, but it also generalizes well on unseen test data. Okay, let's remember this, this architecture because it will be important when we think about how to interpret neural networks. So one could, uh, 
used the traditional methods of interpreting neural networks that were used by uh, computer scientists. For example, the simplest method is we, we, look, we look at the weights of the neural networks and the, the oh, sorry, the, the weights and the biases and look how these connections work and uh, it's like infer some kind of, of, of quantity. But the problem is uh, the interpretation is often quite difficult because the information in a bigger neural network that is like that has more than just two layers and more than just uh, 10 or 20 neurons in the first hidden layers. So this information is so distributed that by, by just looking at the weights, you, you don't get anywhere. And you can you can apply several different techniques. So for example, you can uh, um, look at if you uh, remove some certain parts of the input, see how much it influences the output. And like can that, that way you can go back and infer that some certain part of an input image was important for some kind of predictions. But if we ask the question, what do we expect, what, what type of quantity do we expect to find in a, in, a, in a physical setting, in theoretical physics? It's some kind of equation because we have the advantage in theoretical physics that our quantities are formulated in equations. We are familiar with equations. If you have a, a binary classification problem with cats and dogs, what is the equation of an eye? We don't know, but in theoretical physics, we have a small number of equations and often they are, uh, uh, they're Taylor expansions, or even if we can just find some, uh, some uh, uh, boundary cases, uh, then this Taylor expansion often becomes accurate enough to, to describe the, the quantity. And we, we are so familiar with Taylor expansions of functions that we can infer the real functions by knowing just uh, Taylor expansion. So it's like the idea is uh, we look at just one single neuron. And if this neuron contains the information of just one single observable or quantity, there must be some kind of uh, bijective mapping between the this neuron uh, with respect to the input between the neuron and the true observable that the uh, neuron is learning. So the idea is uh, we either look at different architectures of neural networks and we identify if they have some kind of bottleneck where all the information gets fed through or we impose a bottleneck so where we can identify what the neural network has learned by regression. Let's look at uh, uh, one of the uh, most famous applications of neural networks to theoretical physics, uh, which was, uh, so several different people have, have thought about it. And uh, I think the, so, and the first one who has published it was uh, uh, Juan Carasquilla and uh, Roger Malico. Um, and uh, the point is here, you perform a Monte Carlo simulation of some kind of uh, physical system in this case, in our example case, it's the two-dimensional Ising model on the square lattice. The Ising model is just a spin model with spins that it can either point up or down. And uh, you see when you simulate uh, at low temperatures, you get uh, phases where uh, domains with spins pointing up are uh, clustered together and phases where spins pointing down are clustered together. And in high temperature regime, regimes, uh, the spins uh, alignment is, is rather random. So we also assume that there is some kind of phase transition. And now we apply the neural network to find that phase transition. So we assume at low temperatures, we're in a ferromagnetic phase. At high temperatures, we're in a paramagnetic phase. So we use these two, uh, two temperature regimes as labeled training data. So high temperature regimes is one class, a low temperature regime is the other class. And we train a neural network on this data and we apply this neural network later in the intermediate regime and classify uh, Monte Carlo samples in each of these temperature points to see where the phase transition is. And uh, if we do that, we find that there is a, 
a very steep change in the average classification probability. And uh, the, there is a, um, the change occurs where almost where the exact critical temperature is, which is known by Onsago solution, uh, which is 2.269. Okay, um, now we can go on and see what this neural network has learned. But uh, let's, let's come back to the architecture of a simple feedforward neural network. So where is a natural bottleneck or where could we impose a bottleneck? Um, in this case, there's only one natural bottleneck, which is the output neuron, which uh, gives you the, which classifies uh, the, the sample, which uh, gives us either zero or one. So we use this, that as natural bottleneck. But uh, if we now want to perform a regression analysis in some sense, it would just fail because we have way too many input features for regression. So the idea is now, in addition to having identified this bottleneck, we need to find some way to make regression feasible. And uh, the way we do this in this case is uh, we reduce the number of uh, parameters that the neural network, uh, that the regression algorithm has that interprets the bottleneck neuron in some way. And we do that by uh, introducing this interpretation net, which is a, a collection of different neural networks that can learn different functions. So let's imagine this would be an icing spin configuration and this lower network is the most general neural network we can think of. It's a convolutional network that according to the universal approximation theorem can learn any function if it has sufficiently many neurons and layers. And uh, the idea is here, we reduce the uh, complexity of the functions that the neural networks can learn. We retrain the neural network again and we see when we observe a performance drop. So in the case of the Ising model, uh, let's imagine this would be a, a part of an uh, Ising spin configuration where each of this is, a, this is a spin. At the beginning, this network can see the whole uh, spin lattice and it can learn any correlation and any function. Now, if we restrict the uh, capacity of this neural network in a smart way, uh, we can deny the neural network to be able to learn some things. And uh, that way, by reducing the capacity more and more, at one point, we come to a point where we have denied the neural network the ability to learn a certain crucial quantity, which was important to classify the sample. So we have different, so we have, Let's, let's just, let me just say this again. So we have different neural networks and we reduce the capacity in some sense that makes sense. In the case of the Ising model, it's we think the quantity might be somehow extensive or local. So we uh, reduce the receptive field size until we get to the point we cannot learn some certain correlations anymore. They get dropped, the performance drops, and we know that th these types of correlations were important. Let's... Uh, look at what happens if we uh, perform this interpretation procedure at the Ising model in two dimensions. So on the right top, we have uh, a collection of four different neural networks. One is a network that can learn everything. Another one that can learn nearest neighbor correlations, but nothing beyond that. And another one that can only learn the spin self correlation. So there, it cannot learn uh, the correlation of one spin with any specific spin on the lattice anymore. And the other uh, network is just the baseline. And we can see here, if we go from the full network to the network that can only learn nearest neighbor spin configuration, we still, we are able to perform perfectly. But if we drop this correlation, we are not able to perform perfectly anymore. And if we go even lower, we can't learn anything anymore. So that means we know that the information is contained, uh, th that the dominant information is contained in uh, nearest neighbor spin correlations and uh, the spin itself. 
And uh, if we now perform a regression analysis on uh, these small subnetworks, then because there are almost no parameters left now, we can immediately see that uh, one quantity that the output neuron of the neural network uh, learns is the magnetization, and uh, the other one is the expected energy per spin side. We could, of course, already have guessed that because you cannot, you cannot construct many more functions uh, out of these correlations. But uh, that is what you get, even if you do not know what uh, the magnetization, for example, is a priori. And this deduction can be vis visualized and confirmed by uh, having a, a perfect correlation between uh, the magnetization and this latent prediction, which is the output of the last neuron without the sigmoid function. And uh, the same can be said for this network uh, where we also get a perfect correlation between the energy and the output of uh, the last neuron in this network. Um, we can now go on uh, to a more complicated model. So I'm just mentioning this model to, to brag a bit about what we can do. Uh, the ones who don't understand lattice gauge theory don't need to learn it. And the uh, ones who, who know lattice gauge theory, they will remember what I'm talking about. So in uh, SU2 lattice gauge theory, we think about uh, uh, quarks and gluons that uh, make up uh, hadrons. Uh, and in lattice gauge theory, in our case, we assume we have fixed quarks on the lattice sites and gluons connecting these lattice sites. And uh, quarks are heavy and static and gluons uh, fluctuate. Uh, normally it would be described by SU2, uh, SU3 gauge theory, but uh, in order to reduce the computational complexity, we use SU2 gauge theory, which has the same type of phase transition. And we can apply this type of supervised learning again with train on Monte Carlo samples, which are generated using this Wilson action. As I said, you don't need to understand it. Uh, at, uh, what, is, what are the details that are happening? We train at low temperatures uh, and at high temperatures, and we evaluate the network in these intermediate temperatures. And uh, we find that the neural network uh, phase transition is close to what we get when we use a lattice calculation using some type of order parameter. And uh, if you now look at what this neural network has learned, uh, we can again apply the same procedure as in the Ising model. We find that this is the full network that has the full receptive field size of uh, uh, 1000 spin sites in four dimensions. And we find that only uh, the, the extent in the temporal dimension is important to recover all the information that is necessary to, to classify uh, the phases. We can then perform a regression analysis, which turns out to be the trace uh, of two connecting uh, uh, unitary matrices in time direction. And uh, if we plug this in, in our equation for the last neuron, we find that this is the well-known Polyakov loop order parameter. And remember, we have constructed this order parameter without knowing it before. So, uh, we could use this in principle to find new order parameters. It's tough, but in principle, it would be possible. And uh, let me just mention, uh, that I, I think there's also a, a poster uh, by, by our colleagues in Basel uh, about uh, interpretable phase classification. So I'm excited to uh, learn more about what this is about. Another neural network that we already know that has a bottleneck is the autoencoder. So, we already have the data produced from our Monte Carlo algorithm. In this case, uh, so the, the, the autoencoder, uh, when it's trained, tries to minimize the reconstruction error while it is compressed through these latent variables. We supply it with Monte Carlo samples from all over the place, from all temperatures. We don't need to label them uh, with different phases. So we don't need to assume any, any phase. And uh, 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 after we have trained, we look at what is happening at this natural bottleneck. And if we, if we look at it, uh, we see that uh, 
in this natural bottleneck, the autoencoder has uh, encoded the order parameter, which is in our case, the magnetization. And uh, uh, we, we see here that the latent parameter is perfectly correlated with the magnetization. We can see that it's uh, clustered. So that gives us the ability to distinguish between phases, even if, we, even if we don't know about these different phases before. And we can uh, draw a similar plot to the phase classification plot where we can read off a very vague estimate for the phase transition. And uh, uh, what, is, what is nice here, uh, at the beginning, I didn't think uh, that this will have much use in, in theoretical physics, but uh, mostly uh, chemists and material scientists are now using this property of autoencoders that uh, the latent uh, variable is an approximation to some kind of order parameters as a method to find phase transitions in, in their systems, which, uh, which, I'm, uh, which I find really exciting. Another neural network that uh, we can interpret are these Siamese neural networks for similarity detection. Uh, can I just get the time? Yes, you have uh, five minutes left until the question session. OK, thanks. Uh, OK, so the last neural network that we are looking at are Siamese neural networks. So uh, if, we if we remember, these are used for similarity detection. So it's, we get uh, a pair of input data points. And uh, these are put through uh, neural networks that share their weights and uh, translate the input to some kind of latent representation after which the latent representation is compared either by, uh, uh, by a Manhattan distance or by some kind of measure or a network, uh, after which one can deduce if this pair uh, is from a, from a similar class or from a different, different class. And uh, if we apply that as an example case to a simple problem in theoretical physics, uh, which is just planets uh, rotating around the sun. Our problem formulation is given two observations of pos positions and velocities, do they belong to the same particle trajectories? So um, in our case of the Siamese neural networks, we prepare a data set of positive data where the pair is connected by solving the equations of motion. And uh, we then uh, prepare a negative data set where uh, we just permute uh, the pairs from the positive solution. So it's very unlikely that two observations are connected by uh, solving the equations of motion. And uh, we use this data to train the neuro uh, a Siamese neural network to distinguish between positive and negative pairs. And uh, if we now interpret with the, our bottleneck interpretation scheme, what this neural network has learned, we find that uh, in this, uh, if we have only one single latent representation neuron uh, and we perform regression, we find that uh, this neuron learns to encode uh, uh, one component of the angular momentum. And, uh, we can confirm this deduction by this perfect correlation of this intermediate output, which is the output in the later representation and the angular momentum. And uh, in, our, in our paper, we have, uh, we have found several other uh, uh, invariants and conserved quantities using this method. So in another step, we can also find the energy, for example. And uh, in the end, uh, this method is now is so powerful that you can use it to find uh, new conserved quantities in unknown systems. And what is, what is cool here, uh, we have colleagues from, uh, from Kassel in Germany who are now uh, using this method to find invariants in their uh, differential equations de describing uh, biological systems. And they have already found one, which is quite, quite cool. Okay, 
let me just come to my summary then. So the interpretation of artificial neural networks is hard because the information is distributed among many layers and neurons. But since we have a specific type of information that is formulated in equations in theoretical physics, the interpretation becomes possible by identifying bottlenecks and reducing uh, the regression parameters uh, that uh, one, uh, like by in identifying bottlenecks and performing regression with the help of some kind of procedure that minimizes the number of parameters in this regression analysis. And what is now cool is this interpretation is constructive and can give us insight into the underlying physics in many different kinds of systems, in many different kinds of networks. So if we apply neural networks to face recognition, we know that they learn order parameters uh, given by Landau's theory of phase transition or some kinds of energies that uh, was used by Aaron Fest's classifications of phase transitions, and we can retrieve them and, and use them in principle. And these Siamese networks uh, for similarity detections, they learn invariants and, or, or conserved quantities, and they can be used to find these invariants in previously unknown systems. And uh, so our next step is to combine this with symbolic regression, which uh, I've also heard being discussed in one of the previous talks. And uh, let's see where we already can get using this. Okay, thank you for your attention.